From Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. And welcome, one and all, to the Audio Imaginarium. And first order of business, of course, Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. And especially to my mom, back in Brantford. Uh, and she will be turning 90 in a few weeks and uh, is a- an absolute force of nature. So if you're listening, Mom, and you're still up, uh, I love you. Of course you know that. Now, one of the hallmarks of this program is that we give, I like to think, a pretty fair hearing to just about anyone, as long as they're not peddling hate. Uh, and just, But however, let me just issue this caveat, uh, because just because we have someone on the program and we hear them out and we provide a safe and respectful platform, it doesn't necessarily mean that I subscribe to what they're saying. And that is admittedly the case with our next guest. But I'm interested, most interested, in what he is about to say. I'm curious to know how he and other members of the society that he is director of, how they've arrived at their conclusions. I think this will make for some interesting listening, even if you don't agree. And I'm willing to say that probably 99% of you don't. The modern-day Flat Earth Society, formerly represented by the International Flat Earth Research Society, maintains that the Earth is indeed flat, not an oblate spheroid. In fact, here in Canada, we have our own Flat Earth Society, which was formed in 1970 by philosopher Leo Ferrari, writer Raymond Fraser, and poet Alden Nolan. And it was active until 1984. Now, let me crib from my guest's website, which we've linked up to at richardserrett.com, and uh, the website is the Atlantean Conspiracy.com. Here's what he has to say. Wolves in sheep's clothing have pulled the wool over our eyes. For almost 500 years, the masses have been thoroughly deceived by a cosmic fairy tale of astronomical proportions. We have been taught a falsehood so gigantic and diabolical that it has blinded us from our own experience and common sense, from seeing the world and the universe as they truly are. Through pseudoscience, books and programs, mass media and public education, universities and government propaganda, the world has been systematically brainwashed. Well, I'm in agreement so far. (laughs) Slowly indoctrinated over centuries into the unquestioning belief of the greatest lie of all time. A multi-generational conspiracy has succeeded in the minds of the masses to pick up the fixed earth shape it into a ball, spin it in circles, and throw it around the sun. The greatest cover-up of all time, NASA and Freemasonry's biggest secret, is that we are living on a plane, not a planet. That Earth is the flat, stationary center of the universe. Eric Dubai, or Eric Dubé, rather, is an American living in Thailand, where he teaches yoga and uh, uh, and part-time while exposing the New World Order full-time. He is also the author of four books and president of the International Flat Earth Research Society. He joins us via Skype from his home in Thailand. Eric, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on, Richard. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Is it Dubai? It's Dubai. Terrific. It is, yeah. All right. My dad's a big uh, fan of your show. He listens to every uh, one. So, hey, Dad, I'm sure he's listening right now. Absolutely. Shout out to Dad. Thank you. Uh, now, is your may I ask? Is your mother still uh, uh, living? She is. All right. And Do you happy want to Mother's shout to her as well? Exactly. Yeah. Shout there you out go. To my mom. She'll be hearing at some point. Probably not uh, live like my dad is. All right. Now, uh, let me reiterate again. Make it very clear. I don't believe for a minute that the Earth is flat. But as I say, I'm fascinated. Uh, by the theory, I'm looking forward to to speaking with you. I'm not here to mock or ridicule or ambush you or shoot you down. I'm going to sit. I'm going to listen. I'm going to ask a few challenging questions. Time permitting, we may also have some callers who'd like to ask you some questions. Uh, and to quote Mr. Zimmerman, then more than likely you'll go your way and I'll go mine. But let me begin by asking you, Eric, uh, first the, the idea of a, a flat earth. 
Um, I mean, that was sort of the predominant theory up until, you know, Aristotle in around 300 BC uh, talked about the Earth being a, a spheroid. But how how did this idea become resurrected? Bring us up to speed on sort of the more the modern day flat Earth society. Yeah, throughout history, all around the world, the flat, motionless Earth was a given. It was known until around 500 BC. Pythagoras was the first one to come up with the spinning ball model. And as you mentioned, Aristotle later came up with uh, some more proofs, in quotations, uh, for the spinning ball model. And it didn't really pick up speed, though, until around 1500s, when Copernicus wrote his book. And then with the uh, Newton and Galileo, uh, it picked up more speed, and now with NASA, you, it's, you, you can't find anybody that believes uh, the Earth is flat. Everyone believes that it's a spinning ball. And that word belief is pretty interesting when you look at this, because you say, I believe that we're on a flat Earth, but in fact, I see that I'm on a flat Earth, and I feel that I'm on a motionless Earth, and I see that everything in the sky revolves around me. I also see that the sun and the moon are the same size. But I've been brainwashed to believe something very different from what I see. I've been brainwashed to believe that the completely flat horizon that I always see curves at some point. I've been brainwashed to believe that the motionless earth that I feel beneath my feet is actually spinning at a thousand miles per hour. I've also been brainwashed to believe that the stars, sun, and moon that clearly spin overhead are actually some of them we're spinning around and, and there's this big uh, spiral motion of, of planets and galaxies all spiraling as NASA has told us. Uh, they also tell us that the sun is a big ball of burning light and it's 400 times further away and 400 times uh, bigger than the moon. Yet when I look out in the sky, I can see them to be both the same size. So, in fact... What we believe nowadays is based on something contrary to our common sense and experience and actually comes from philosophers like Aristotle giving us supposed proofs of a ball earth and NASA, Photoshop, CGI divisions giving us uh, fake pictures, believe, uh, making us believe otherwise. Uh, but if, you know, if we were just given to our own devices, everybody would be a flat earther because that's how it is. It's flat, it's motionless, everything in the sky re revolves around us. And that common sense perspective actually has been experimentally proven as well, many, many ways. My book has over 200 proofs. There's a book in the 1800s called uh, 100 Proofs the Earth is Not a Globe. That, and that, was based on the, that was based on something called the Bedford Level Experiment. Uh, now, we're coming up on a break. Uh, can you... What was that, the Bedford Level Experiment? Do you recall? The Bedford Level Experiment was an experiment by Samuel Robotham, who was another flat Earth author in the mm -hmm. 1800s. And it was basically an experiment to test if the natural physics of water are as they appear to be, that uh, water finds and remains level. And if that's the case, then we couldn't possibly be on a spinning ball Earth because the all the water, the oceans, the earth would have to be curved. Um, yet we know that the natural physics of water is to find and remain level. So on the Bedford level there, it's just a really long canal stretch of straight water that you can do d different measurements to figure out if there actually is the supposed curvature that they say there is in the earth. Um, they, they say the earth is a 25,000 mile in circumference ball. So using spherical trigonometry, you can figure out the curvature, which figures out to 8 inches per mile when you square the mile. So uh, the first mile is 8 inches, the second is 32 uh, inches, 72 inches, 128 inches, 200 inches. Got it. Let um, me just jump in here, uh, Eric. Uh, we're going to take a time out. We'll come back. Eric Dubé is with us, the director, or the president, rather, of the International Flat Earth Research Society. Yes, it's still out there. And we'll find out why he insists the earth is in fact flat back with more of the conspiracy show don't you dare go away where there's smoke there's the conspiracy show with richard serrett welcome back we have a real humdinger uh, of an hour here eric dubay is with us joining us via skype from his home in thailand 
And uh, he uh, contends, insists, maintains most confidently that the Earth is flat. He is the president of the International Flat Earth Re- Research uh, Society. Now, you were talking about uh, the, uh, the the curvature of the Earth. If it, it, it's supposedly uh, curving, the curvature is approximately eight inches per mile. So if it was just eight inches per mile, it would be a downward straight slope. So you have to use spherical trigonometry. So it's actually eight inches per mile when you square the mile after that. So there's an exponential drop over time. Um, And you're able to measure, uh, for instance, the Bedford experiment you were talking about was over six miles. You should be able, the Earth should drop 16 feet. So you should be able to measure that. And it's never been measured, whether using telescopes, binoculars, flags, lasers, uh, they've done many tests over the, t- the ages, and there's never been even uh, the slightest bit of curvature, not even a little bit. So even if uh, the Earth was a ball, but they got the figure wrong and the circumference was actually much, much bigger, you'd be able to measure some curvature. Uh, but there's never been any curvature measured whatsoever. All right. What is, if the, the Earth is flat, we can't show people visuals, but give us a mental picture. What does this plate look like that we're all riding around on? or standing on, rather. It's stationary. Sure. But what does it look like, this plate? The uh, azimuthal equidistant projection map that the USGS actually uses is uh, the flat Earth map. The UN logo is another example of it. The UN logo is actually a flat Earth map uh, with divided into 33 Masonic sections, by the way. Um, but you can just type in flat Earth map on Google and... Uh, It's a disk shape. The North Pole is in the center. All the continents go out from there. And Antarctica, instead of being a uh, ice continent on the bottom of the globe, actually surrounds us 360 degrees. And how far that ice goes outwards uh, is unknown at this point. So it's a cover-up. That's what the Antarctic Treaty is all about. That's why you can't independently explore Antarctica. And when people like Jarl and uh try to go down there, they get turned away at gunpoint and put in prison. So um, there's a big uh, cover-up there in Antarctica as well. I don't know how far the ice goes, whether there's an edge, a barrier, a dome, or infinite plane. Um, but what we do know is that the earth and the water is completely flat. For as far as we can see and as far as we've measured. And the horizon is completely flat as far up as we go. All amateur rockets and all amateur balloons sent up over 20 miles, as high as they can go, the horizon is flat all the way around, and it rises to the camera all the way up, uh, rises to the level of the camera. Now, this is totally impossible on a ball, no matter how big the ball was. As you rise up, you have to look down to see the curvature look down to see the horizon but what actually happens if you go up in a hot air balloon the horizon rises right on up with you the whole way up just keeps on coming up at eye level as high as you're going to go that's just impossible on a ball if you think about it if the if you're on a ball and you're in a hot air balloon or an airplane you should not be able to see out your window straight out your window the horizon you should have to look down further and further down the higher you ascend to be able to see that horizon but Hmm. you'll never look down to the horizon on the earth Hmm. it will always rise up to your level so that's the horizon proof Uh, there's many other proofs we can get into if you'd like to yeah i i I don't quite frankly have an answer for that one i hadn't thought about that the the idea of being in a hot air balloon and having to look down uh but being able to look straight ahead and see the horizon interesting however let me ask you about uh, what has been regarded as one of the strangest objects in the heavens, and that is the moon. Uh, and it's strange for a lot of reasons, but I, wa- I bring up the moon now because the idea that if the Earth is, in fact, a sphere and it's rotating, that would account for this oval shadow that it produces each and every lunar eclipse. Does that not prove this, sh- this, l- this oval shadow that can be seen on the moon each and every lunar eclipse, uh, uh, does that not prove, Eric, that the Earth is not only round but spherical? Well, this is one of those proofs in quotations that I was telling you about. They claim that the shadow that goes across the moon during a lunar eclipse is actually the shadow of the ball Earth. And that's a proof that the Earth is a ball because you can see the ballish shadow eclipsing the moon. Now, 
in fact, it's been on record over 50 times in the past 2,000 years that there's been a lunar eclipse while the sun is still in the sky in the same vantage point that you can see an eclipse. Now, this makes their theory impossible because their theory uh, maintains that the sun would be behind the ball earth and the moon would be in a 180 degree syzygy so they, they would be in a straight line and that's the only way that you could get the ball earth shadow on the moon from the sun if, is if the sun was lighting it from behind. But, as I said, the sun is in the sky many times while these eclipses are happening. You can clearly see them both. So the angle is not there. And it's absolutely impossible that what we're seeing is the shadow of the Earth. And, in fact, if you look at ancient astrology, ancient astronomy, you'll find that what does eclipse the moon is called Rahu, R-A-H-U, or the black sun. It's a third celestial body that they don't tell us about that is the same size as the sun and the moon that eclipses them. It's a dark body. And that's what causes eclipses, not the Earth's shadow. Uh, are, you, are you referring to, when you mention this third celestial body, uh, what some have called Nibiru or Planet X? Interesting. I haven't thought of that uh, idea, whether they uh, go together at at all. I haven't looked too deeply into the Planet X Nibiru thing because it's all based on this spinning ball Earth cosmology and it just seems like, you know, Zachariah Sitchin, his Masonic work on it, it all puts me, up, puts me off the wrong way. It looks like more NASA style science fiction. So okay. I, haven't, I haven't looked too much into the Planet X Nibiru thing, but I, I suppose very well could be some sort of crossover in the mythologies. Are, are there, uh, according to the Flat Earth uh, research, does that then preclude the existence of other spheroid celestial bodies? Does that mean that there, that all planets are flat, or are we the only uh, sort of plate? Right. Well, we're a plane, not a planet. So all they did was add a T to the end, and everybody bought it. But in reality, Earth is the only physical plane, and everything above us is just a light so there, there is no spherical, terra firma, ball planets like Mars, Jupiter, and all, all these things that NASA presents us with. You know, the, the moon landing is fake, and it's done here on Earth. The Mars footage is fake, and then done here on Earth. The, you know, all the CGI images you've ever seen of all these planets, you'll notice that there is no actual uh, footage. Type in real planet footage or, or something along those lines in YouTube, and you'll not find a single real uh, video of a planet. And when you look at planets through amateur telescopes, they just look like flat, circular disks of light, just like stars. And in fact, for thousands of years, they were called stars. They're called the wandering stars, as they differ from the fixed stars in their relative motions only. The fixed stars stay completely fixed together in their constellations, day after day, year after year, millennia after millennia, which is another proof that we're not on a spinning ball going all around the galaxy like they tell us, because Polaris, the North Pole star, stays exactly where it is, right above us, and all the other stars rotate in a dome-like planetarium shape eastward in a 24 hour cycle all around us and the wandering stars so called because they kind of wander their own unique paths um, but they're still in a general motion they do a kind of a spirograph pattern around the sun so no the sun the moon the stars and the wandering stars that are now called planets are just lights and they, they light up the night sky they give us a uh, calendrical time. Um, they divide not only the night from the day, but the years and the months, etc. The word month comes from moon, moon month. And it's uh, the cycle is the same, the, the female cycle as well. So there's a lot of uh, parallels between, you know, as above, so below. That's where astrology comes from as well. When you When you propagate the spinning ball earth model, then suddenly astrology, which was an ancient science of consciousness known to our ancestors suddenly becomes like some stupid superstition because how could the position of the stars over us have any um, significance? But if we are the only plane in existence and everything in the heavens truly does revolve around us, then that denotes a special importance to not only Earth but to humans, the most intelligent of the intelligent designers' designs. Uh, if we're just, you know, on the speck of 
God's fingernail in the corner of the universe, like NASA wants us to believe, then it's a very nihilistic, atheistic kind of view. Uh, uh, that part, of, that part I, I agree. I, I, that part I agree, uh, and I take a lot of flack. We, we obviously we talk a lot about UFOs in this program and and uh, um, extraterrestrials, and I don't subscribe to that theory. I think we are unique in the universe. I think this phenom- this UFO. ET phenomenon uh, that we're talking about interdimensional uh, uh, mm-hmm. entities here. I think we are in a, in a sweet spot in the universe, and I think we are we are alone. This the universe was created for us. However, uh, let me um, go back to some of these other you call them proofs, and uh, obviously you've heard all of these before. But I'll throw them out to you, and you can uh, handle them as you will. And that is, of course, the old ships in the horizon argument that you go down to the beach, and you do not see. Uh, a, 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 as ships approaching, they don't just appear out of the horizon uh, like they would if the world was in flat, fact flat. They seem to emerge from beneath the sea uh, because they're obviously, you know, they're not emerging from the waves, but they're coming up into the horizon. So does that not, I mean, to the, to the naked eye, obviously, to me anyway, I look at that and I say, well, obviously, that's because the earth is round. Well, that's another one of the old proofs. Um, but in fact, it's a proof of the opposite when you do it yourself. Because what happens is if you watch a boat disappearing over the horizon, as you said, the hull is going to disappear before the masthead. And people have been saying for centuries that that's because it's going over the curvature of the ball earth. But if that was the case, then after it disappeared from sight, from going over the curvature of the ball earth, you would not be able to bring it back into sight by using, say, a zoom camera, a binoculars, or a telescope. But in fact, you can uh, let the boat completely disappear and then train a telescope on it, and you will bring the entirety of the boat, including the hull, back into view, proving that it did not descend over a wall of convex water, And in fact, the horizon is the vanishing line of perspective from your point of view. And that's why you can zoom in on it, or if you uh, rise in altitude, you can see more, or on a clearer day, you can see more, uh, see further. The horizon is not the curvature of the ball earth, as we've been told. It is simply the vanishing line of perspective, the law of perspective, as any artist would know. The same reason, you know, uh, railroad tracks seem to converge. Uh, on each other, off in the distance, this kind of thing. All right. Uh, or or this, in the hallway okay. as well, the ceiling and the, sure. and the floor converge, yeah. All right. Same now, idea. Um, you, you've mentioned, you mentioned the constellations earlier, and let me just throw this one out again. And, and just to remind people, Eric Dubé is with us, the president of the International Flat Earth Society, or Flat Earth Research Society, joining us here on The Conspiracy Show from his home in Thailand. And um, uh, let, before I get to the next one, and we are approaching another break, and I want to talk about some of these things you've already mentioned, but we'll come back to them. Uh, when, for you, did this realization uh, happen? I mean, you grew up, I'm, I'm guessing, in a public school system. You had the same sort of, as you call it, propaganda, uh, brainwashing. Uh, what was the aha moment for Eric Dubé that the earth was flat? Uh, it took years of researching before I, I finally said, yep, it's for sure. Because it, what, it, what it's like when you're researching the flat earth, it's like you've got your hands out. You've got the ball earth in one hand, you've got the flat earth in the other hand. And you think that there's a lot of proof for the ball and not so much proof for the flat earth. And then you start to look into it and you find all of these proofs for the flat earth. And then you find all these debunked supposed proofs for the ball earth. And then your ball earth hand just starts getting weighted down with lies and your flat earth hand just rises up until you realize that we've been completely lied to and the earth is in fact flat. So um, I would recommend that this process will certainly happen to everyone who reads my book, The Flat Earth Conspiracy, and I've gotten rave reviews saying so. And also you can check out the all the 1800s flat earth material. That's where my main aha moment came from was reading Robotham's books, Carpenter's books, uh, like, like we talked about, 100 Proofs the Earth's Not a Globe, um, this one called Zetetic Cosmogony and Zetetic Astronomy. These are both good ones. Uh, if you come to my uh, International Flat Earth Research Society, it's 
ifers.boards.net, I-F-E-R-S. Uh, I've got all those books there and many other materials uh, that you can look through. How many members so you do you have? have How many members do you have at the International Flat Earth Research Society? I just restarted it. Uh, as you mentioned, the International Flat Earth Research Society was the first uh, Flat Earth Society in, in the 50s, and then Leo Ferraris came along in the 70s, and then um, his is the only one that existed in the form of the Flat Earth Society online. Um, and so I just restarted the International Flat Earth Research Society uh, just a few months ago. So we've got about 500 members and uh, about 800 guests visiting every day at the moment. But any uh, any uh, scientists, astronomers that are that are part of your organization? Uh, yeah, we just had one join that she went to school for astrophysics, and she uh, she didn't finish her degree. She said, and she's quite glad now that she started looking into everything. Interesting. All right, Eric, stay put. We'll come back on the other side. The Flat Earth. Believe it or not. Come back and uh, listen to some more of my conversation with Eric Dubay right here on The Conspiracy Show. Big Brother is listening, and so are you, to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Welcome back. Eric Dubay joining us live from Thailand via Skype talking about uh, the Flat Earth. Uh, I was on um, my, uh, my uh, lovely bride, the mighty Aphrodite, uh, is in Greece at the moment, and we were on uh, FaceTime uh, at about 5 o'clock, five o'clock uh, this afternoon, and uh, she was getting ready for bed. It was midnight in Greece. So we have time zones, the idea of time zones. Do not, the uh, Eric, the existence of time zones. How can we have time zones if the Earth is flat? I mean, we should all be seeing the sun. I mean, if the Earth is not rotating on its own axis, then we should all be experiencing, you know, the same daylight at the same time, shouldn't we? The sun is not 93 million miles away, as we're told, nor is the Earth a ball spinning around it. In fact, the Earth is a flat plane, and the Sun is a disk that spins over and around the Earth in circles every day. Same with the Moon. If you can imagine the yin-yang sign, uh, the Chinese yin-yang symbol is actually a symbol representing the Sun and the Moon's path over the flat Earth. So imagine the yin-yang spiraling in a circle. The Sun, you can't see the Sun all over the Earth from every point at all times. Uh, and time zones are caused by its uh, motion over the flat Earth, over and around it. So every 15 degree demarcation point around the circle is one hour, and it will do this 24 times a day. Um, so time zones are caused by the sun moving over and around the Earth, not by the Earth spinning around the, uh, the Earth spinning, as they say. All right, um, gravity. We have, we have to talk about gravity. And if the Earth is a sphere, then, you know, no matter where you're standing on a sphere, because it's a consistent shape, you have exactly the same amount of sphere under you. So the, um, you know, the center of gravity doesn't, doesn't change wherever you are on the sphere. But if you're on a plane, a flat plane, you know, think about, uh, I guess, spinning a dish around or something like that, a, a dinner plate. The center of mass is and a flat plane is more or less in the center. Am I? Are we in agreement so far? The, the center of mass. The center it, of the center of mass of a flat plane is in its center, more or less. But it's, it's not spinning, though, right? It's stationary, and the mass is distributed all over the Earth. Uh, I don't know how much more mass there would be at the very center than in Antarctica or in the continents. Um, so I wouldn't quite say that now. Ah, that's that's true. If it's not spinning, then then the the center of gravity would be consistent. Okay. Right. Now, now gravity doesn't exist. Gravity is just their catch-all term uh, for what they can't explain. So they say that the reason that the oceans, buildings, and people don't fall off the underside of the ball Earth is because of gravity. It holds us on. They say the reason that you don't feel the thousand mile per hour spinning atmosphere going eastward all the time is because gravity pulls the atmosphere along with the spinning ball Earth just so perfectly so you don't feel it. 
They say gravity causes the moon to orbit the earth and the earth to orbit the sun. And gravity actually is what caused the sun and the moon and the earth and everything to form in the first place in their materialistic cosmology where they try to get rid of God and they use gravity instead, another G word. And gravity is actually what created the planets and the sun and the moon and everything. And gravity caused the Big Bang and gravity pulls the ocean's tides. Interesting how gravity supposedly pulls the ocean's tides, but it can never reach the lakes, ponds, marshes, and other bodies of water, can it? It just pulls the oceans. Nice, nice. Gravity, that's gravity for you. But it, in reality, everything that nowadays is explained through gravity was already explained adequately through the laws of density and buoyancy. So if you drop a feather and it slowly floats to the ground, or you drop a brick and it drops right to the ground quickly, or you fill up a helium balloon and it rises, or you fill up a hydrogen balloon and it rises even faster, this is all based on density and buoyancy. It has nothing to do with gravity. Gravity is this fictional pulling force that they say pulls us to the center of the ball earth and keeps us from falling off of it. But they can't actually show you any example of some mass by virtue of its large mass alone causing other masses to stick to or orbit around it as the, they claim gravity, this force gravity does. So gravity was given to us by a knighted Freemason, Sir Isaac Newton, who just took the pre-existing laws of density and buoyancy and applied it to the budding heliocentric spinning ball model. And that's what we're taught in schools nowadays. All right, we'll take another time out. Uh, I, I've been on a plane. I've, um, you know, f fairly long trips on a plane. And it seems planes can travel in a relatively straight line for a very long time and not fall off any edges. Uh, they can, and also theoretically, some do, f actually circle the Earth nonstop. So we'll find out what that portends. What does that mean in terms of a flat Earth? Theory. Back with more of my conversation with Eric Dubay here on The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. In a democracy, we elect officials so we can sleep at night. So why are you up? All right, we are back. Our last segment with Eric Dubay, a president of the International Flat Earth Research Society, joining us live on the line from his home in Thailand, or I should say via Skype, uh, here on The Conspiracy Show. Uh, now, uh, people may remember, it's long gone now, but the, the Concorde, uh, the Superjet, and uh, this was a phenomenal uh, aircraft. Uh, this um, thing, it, I, its top cruising altitude was something like 60,000 feet. That's about 11 miles high. And, uh, I mean... F I've seen pictures taken from the Concorde. I don't. I um, I'd like to know how you respond. I mean, when you see pictures taken from the Concorde, 11 miles up, you can clearly see the curvature of the Earth, Eric. Are those photos or, faked, or what is? What? Are, how do you respond to that? Well, the fact that you see the horizon out your window at 60,000 feet at eye level, as I said, already tells you that the horizon is flat. It couldn't possibly be curved and still be out your window at 60,000 feet because you're above it. No matter how big the ball is, they say it's 25,000 miles in circumference. Imagine it was 25 million miles in circumference. If you're 60,000 feet above it and you look straight out your window, you should be looking off into outer space, shouldn't you? But you won't. You'll be looking straight at the horizon. And if you see that the horizon warps a little bit, it's because of the curve in the window. There's a curve in every... Uh, commercial airplane window, or a wide-angle fisheye lens like in the Red Bull dive. You'll notice they used on the outside cameras for that Red Bull dive, Felix Bumgardner did, the outside cameras are fisheye lenses. And so the supposed curvature of the Earth starts right from the, the base of the Earth all the way up to 128,000 feet. The curve remains the same because it's not the curve of the Earth. It's just the curve of the camera. So when you're seeing, the, and as I mentioned, these amateur uh, rockets and balloons that have been sent up over 20 miles, so much higher than the Concorde, and uh, it's still completely flat all the way around and rises to eye level. Uh, when we look over the, you know, the uh, the 60, nearly 60 years of manned missions to space, and we begin with people like Yuri Gagarin, 
from the USSR back in 1961. And again in um, 61, we had Garamond Titoff. And of course, we had the Americans, Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom and John Glenn in around the same time. This space race between the Americans and their enemy, the Soviets, if the Earth was flat, why wouldn't the Americans' enemies blow the whistle? You know, why would they maintain this conspiracy? Well, first of all, Russia and America or any other statist nation are not enemies at the highest levels. They're all friends and they're all Freemasons uh, and usually members of other secretive organizations as well. So the idea that uh, America and Russia are enemies is just like the idea that Macho Man Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan are enemies. But in reality, we know that's fake. And the space programs all over the world are fake. The French program's fake. The Russian program's fake. NASA's fake. The, Jap- <laughs> the new Japanese and Chinese programs are terribly fake. If you take a look at some of their images, uh, they're much worse than the NASA ones. They're even easier to debunk than the NASA images. So these space programs are just a way to fleece the populations from their tax money. NASA's got hundreds of billions of dollars in their pockets to give us crap CGI photos and brainwash the whole world. Um, so the the fact that there's space agencies all over the world that are doing this now uh, doesn't actually you know, mean anything because they're all part of the deception anyway. Anyone selling you a spinning ball earth is leading you up a creek without a paddle. Well, let's talk about the nature of the deception. Uh, what is the point of trying to brainwash the masses that we are living on a on a, a a plate and not a planet what purpose does that serve well this is speculation now because i'm not i'm not the person enacting this deception um as i just said nasa and the other space agencies certainly are some of the biggest black budget black holes in existence so there's definitely a profit motive to do this just as there is with any deception or manipulation you fool people into giving you money and uh, these space agencies aren't aren't the only example we see of governments doing that to us so they're definitely fooling us into giving them money but beyond that there's a spiritual nature to this deception where they're they're materialists and they're trying to come up with this whole cosmology this whole big bang idea that can erase god from existence, erase intelligent design, and maintain that just physical matter, gravity, their god, causes a big bang, sneeze, a creationary explosion, and all of this stuff just coalesces together into this perfect earth and you know uh, celestial bodies and everything that we see around us. Uh, to me, I don't know what you think, Richard, it's pretty obvious that we're in an intelligently designed system here. I, I agree with possibly... you, 100%. <laughs> I agree with you. But I don't see but, how it follows that uh, if you allow for the existence of spheroids uh, in the universe, that that takes God out of the equation. God could just as easily... Uh, in fact, uh, there was an interesting book written a number of years ago called Who Built the Moon? And I had the co-authors on the program, and they talked about what a remarkable heavenly body the moon is uh and there you know the suggestion was that it you know it was built it was designed because without it the, the there would be no uh if the earth or the moon and the earth were in exactly the distance that they are apart there would not be intelligent life uh so on earth so it's as if the moon was designed and they went off on a theory about perhaps it was time travelers and so forth but i mean why it was designed, yes, it was, by God, as the universe yeah. was. Why can, why can we not have God and spheroids at the same time? Oh, well, I mean, spheroids are just a tiny, tiny part of it, right? The spheroid model is just how they, they tried to fit in all the phenomena. But nowadays, we've got the Big Bang evolution, dinosaurs. They, they've built this whole thing up so that people think that we're coming from nothing everything came from nothing and so there is no spiritual layer to existence there is no god everything is material everything is physical you know those status and selfishness materialism it fits into these psychopaths that control everything it fits into their ideology it also fits into their consumer mentality they'd like us to have so that we just keep buying their products and believing their baloney that they sell us um you know, they, they set themselves up as the authority. It's like I told you at the beginning, if you just look out 
uh, you can see the horizon's flat. You can feel that we're not moving. You can see that everything's revolving around us. But then Neil deGrasse Tyson or Carl Sagan comes along and says, oh, silly, you, you believe your senses? You believe your own eyes? Don't do that. Believe me. Here, I'll show you some CGI. I'll show you a documentary. I'll show you a spinning ball earth. And then suddenly you abandon your own senses, your own common sense, your own experience, and you prostrate yourselves at the feet of these authorities and you just believe everything they say. So nowadays everyone is believing that they're on a spinning ball instead of seeing and feeling that they're not. Is it difficult for you uh, in just in society in general? I mean, when people know that, that you are uh, a flat earther, uh, I mean, does it make life difficult for you, uncomfortable? Not at all, no. It's much better knowing the truth and living it and uh, spreading it. And um, no, I don't. I, I've been in the conspiracy scene, writing conspiracy books and stuff for 10 years, so I'm quite used to people ridiculing stuff they know nothing about, and it doesn't affect me. And, and uh, if I may ask, uh, how does your. Uh, you mentioned your father, because he's a fan of the program and so forth. How does. How does do, you, do you discuss this with him? Does he engage you? Is, does he believe. Does he uh, share your. Your theory? Yeah, yeah. He finished reading my book, and he says he's on board now. Really interesting. And be, so before that, he was not on board, and now you've you've convinced him. Yeah, actually, everyone that I've uh, that's been in contact with me who has read my book is a flat earther now. I, I haven't heard of anyone who's read my book and still believes the spinning ball. That's fascinating. Uh, and um, do you? Do you, if I can use the term, do you proselytize? I mean, do you do you do you go out and try and convince other people, or do you do you simply do you allow them to come to you and ask you about it? Sure, all of the above. I make uh, a lot of YouTube videos. I have some blogs and websites, uh, books. I go on forums. I have my own forum. Yeah, I've definitely been proselytizing uh, this and other conspiracy truths for a long time. Have you offered to debate? Uh, let's say a, a non-flat earther, let's say at some academic institution, an astronomer, an, an astrophysicist. Have, have you ever offered to debate uh, any of these individuals and have they ever accepted? No, but I, I would be uh, interested, especially some of the bigger NASA names like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'd love to debate him. And you're confident that you would, uh, you would emerge victorious? <laughs> sure. <laughs> There's not even a shadow of a doubt in your mind that the Earth is flat. No, no, I researched it long enough to make sure that I was correct. It's fascinating. And still researching it now today. I don't have answers for everything. Like I told you, you know, what's beyond the Antarctic ice and stuff, I, I don't know. There's still mysteries to it. But as far as whether the Earth is spinning or a ball, no, it's absolutely not. What about, I mentioned the transit, you know, these, these long flights. Uh, airplanes can now circumnavigate the globe. Uh, they would say, uh, as as one of the proofs that we are not living on a flat Earth, that you can fly yeah. around the Earth nonstop. Right. But you can fly around a flat plane as well. And so all these people from Magellan up to current plane circumnavigations are just going east to west around the flat Earth. They're not going uh, under the supposed ball uh, under Antarctica. There are no routes that go straight over Antarctica, as there should be, such as uh, Australia to South America and some other routes like this, the straightest line path, if we are on a spinning ball Earth, is to go straight across Antarctica. But they never do that. They take the long route around. And when you ask them, why do you take the long route around instead of just going straight, they say, it's too cold. The planes can't handle it. But of course, this doesn't make much sense when they're supposedly out there in outer space and have gone to the moon where it's much colder and much hotter, and they have the technology to do that. So why can't they just go straight across Antarctica with these flights? They never do. So circumnavigation uh, is only east to west, and that's possible on a plane as well as a globe. So this supposed proof doesn't actually prove one way or the other because it, it's possible on both. You mentioned that the United Nations flag uh, is, in fact, a depiction of a flat Earth. So uh, what are they trying to tell us? They're trying to clue us in? Are they teasing us? Why would they do that? Well, it's, it's not only is it a flat Earth map, but it's divided like a bullseye target into 33 sections. And, you know, Freemasonry has sure. 33 degrees. Right. 
So, and it's also blue, like the first three blue degrees of masonry. So to me, the, the flag, the logo is like a big nudge, nudge, wink, wink for the Freemasons of the world. It's the biggest and oldest secret society in existence with over five million members worldwide. And they're the ones who are behind this spinning ball deception from the get go. Uh, so it's kind of a, a way for them, just like all the symbology they use in Hollywood and elsewhere. It's a way for them to communicate to each other like, hey, we know what's going on. Uh, meanwhile, the sheeple public uh, can look at that and really not even pay attention whatsoever and have no idea what's going on. And it gives you this symbolic control over humanity because you know the symbolism, the right brain kind of information, and everyone else is locked in their left brain prisons where they can't read the symbolism and see what you're talking about. Ancient uh, society, ancient languages were all symbolic, you know, hieroglyphics, cuneiform, sure. mm-hmm. they, they were all based on symbols. And so the people who were using those languages were much more right-brained. They're much more uh, right-brained. Well, actually, they're probably even nowadays we're overly left-brained if you look at a, a, yeah, a CAT scan. I think that's but, absolutely uh, true. Uh, Eric, I, w- I wish we had more time. Perhaps we can, uh, maybe I can arrange for a debate on this program. Uh, if you'd be good for that, and I'm sure you would be. Eric, a real pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Leave us with, with a website again. Yeah, it's uh, AtlanteanConspiracy.com. A pleasure to meet you, and uh, and thanks for sharing. Thank you. It's good talking to you. You too. Likewise, Eric Dubay, president of the International Flat Earth Research Society. Fascinating. My website, RichardSerrett.com. Say hello on Twitter, at Richard Serrett. And as always, wherever it leads, follow the truth. <laughs>